The date was June the 4th. The year was 1783. It took place in France, Annonay, France. History was in the making, but no one there that day fully realized all that was about to take place. They gathered around a large platform, and beneath the platform, a large fire belched dark smoke into a large bag that measured 33 feet in diameter. Those who were watching were amazed when ropes were detached and that bag of hot air began to rise. It would rise to nearly 6,000 feet. It finally came down several miles away. And do you know what happened? Instead of the people celebrating it, farmers attacked it with pitchforks as an instrument of the devil because man was not intended to fly. But what took place that June 4th of 1783 was the beginning of flight. It, no one there that day could have imagined things. In fact, Benjamin Franklin was attending as representing the new government in the United States of America. And someone asked Franklin, what good could come from this new thing? And Franklin wisely replied, what good can come from a new baby? No one there realized what would happen. No one would understand that by our time, you would literally be able to travel to the other side of the world. You could be anywhere in 24 hours. No one that day imagined that we would one day put satellites into orbit and they would literally rotate the earth every 90 minutes. No one there realized that day that we would launch Space probes. Voyager 1 has the record for the most miles traveled. It is now over 12 billion miles from Earth. In fact, it recently left our solar system. Amazing. And it started with flight. That story reminds me of one that took place about 17, 1750 years earlier. On a forlorn hill, a man was raised on a simple cross. A crowd gathered around to watch what was going on. Some laughed at him, some taunted him, some grieved for him. But no one understood the full importance. At the end of the day, they removed his lifeless body from the cross and placed it in a borrowed tomb. Little did anyone know that day that what had just happened would change the world until the end of time and beyond. They didn't know that thousands would willingly die a violent death because of their allegiance to the dead man. No one realized it that day, but that day ushered in the age of grace. When we would come to God, not because of how good we are or because of some ceremonial thing that we do, but we would come to God on the basis of grace and that man's sacrifice. Now our church celebrates the beginning of grace and grace itself in many different ways. We celebrate it at Christmas when we remember Christ coming, his birth. We will celebrate it in two weeks when we celebrate Easter and the resurrection. We will also celebrate it this morning with the Lord's Supper as we will take a little piece of bread and a little glass of juice and we will remember what it's all about. If you have found your way to Matthew 26, please pick up your Bibles and follow along with me as we begin reading in verse 26. We will read verses 26 to 30. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Would you pray with me, please? God, open our hearts and minds and our focus to what you have done for us. 
And God, as we study the Lord's Supper, I pray that we would gain greater understanding. As we take the Lord's Supper in a few minutes, I pray that we would experience anew the remarkable nature of your grace and sacrifice for us. In your name I pray. Amen. This morning I want to share three reasons the Lord's Supper has such deep meaning. And here's the first one. You can follow this in your notes. First reason the Lord's Supper has such deep meaning is it pictures Christ's sacrifice. Before this chapter is over, the sacrifice won't be a picture at all. It will be the real thing. This was one of the ways Jesus let his followers know that his death on the cross was no accident. To them it looked like the end. It looked like defeat. But it really wasn't. It was the plan. He took the bread and broke it as they looked on. This wasn't the first time Jesus had taken the Passover with, the, with his men. Since Jesus' public ministry had begun, he had celebrated the Passover with them every single year. They had been together almost constantly. The Passover was one of the most special times of the year for the Jews. It was a reminder of how God had delivered them from the most powerful nation in the world when he sent the ten plagues on Egypt. The Jews at that time had been powerless to get out from under Pharaoh's power, but God had rescued them. He had taken care of them. He had delivered them. And they ate a final meal in their slave quarters. Remember the story of the Passover? How God said the tenth plague will be a death angel who will pass over the land, and every, in every home the firstborn male child will die including in the Jewish homes, unless the Passover lamb has been sacrificed and the blood has been applied over the door and on both sides of the door, and then there will be mercy. There will be safety. The most, one of the most memorable celebrations on the Jewish calendar is the Passover, the celebration of salvation. And it was no accident that when Jesus instituted the Last Supper nearly 1,500 years after the Exodus, that it took place at the very time of the Passover. Because what Jesus brought about through his death was far greater than the deliverance provided by the Lamb's death. In fact, look at this next statement in your notes. The Passover not only looked back to the night the death angel passed over Israel, but it looked forward to Jesus who was the ultimate sacrifice. And as Jesus held up that unleavened bread, that bread that was flat because there was no yeast in it, they watched as he broke it, but they didn't understand. They didn't understand what he meant when he said to them, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. The crucifixion was still, well, a little less than 24 hours away. And so when he said that, those words, it made no sense to them. But it wouldn't be long before the pieces would begin to come together. Within 24 hours, he would be hanging on a cross. Within 24 hours, the nails would pierce his hands and his feet. Within 24 hours, the spear would go up under his rib cage and pierce his lungs. And he would be taken down from the cross and laid in a borrowed tomb. They took the bread that first night, but they didn't understand it. They obeyed and did what he said, but they didn't understand. And then he took the cup and he served it to them. If they had been confused before, they must have been incredibly lacking understanding because he gave them this drink, this cup, and he said, this cup contains my blood, which is shed for you. Can you imagine how strange that would be, not knowing about the cross yet? Now, it makes sense to us because we're looking back. But when they took that cup, they were looking forward. They just didn't know what they were looking for. And he said, this blood which is shed for you. They all knew the story of the Passover lamb being slaughtered and having its blood painted over the doorframe. They'd heard that story since they were little boys. But Jesus about to become the about to shed his blood for them, that made no sense whatsoever. Look at the next statement in your notes. 
The Lamb's blood, which had saved every Israelite family from physical death, was being replaced by Christ's blood, which would save every person from spiritual death. There's even a hint of the importance to every person taking the, his blood. Notice the command, each of you drink from it. For them to be right with God, they had to accept his offer of forgiveness made available through the blood. Only through what Jesus did by shedding his blood for us can we ever be right with God. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1, but please keep your finger there in Matthew 26 because we'll come back to it shortly. We've got a few seconds to find it. I want you to imagine, I want us to go back to the time in time to the crucifixion when Jesus was put to death for our sins. I know it's not a pleasant thought, but imagine with, with me anyway. Imagine there's a table set up and you're asked to confess your worst sin to the person sitting there. One person walks up and said, and when he is asked, confess your most terrible sin. And one guy says, I stole money from my boss. And the man at the table writes down, embezzled, thief, puts it on the table. Next person walks up and said, I gossiped about, about a coworker, And they were so depressed and hurt by what I said that they took their own life. And the man at the table writes down, slanderer. Another person walks up and says, I cheated on my spouse. The man at the table writes down, adulterer. And so it goes, each of us come up and we confess the worst we have done. And while the worst we have done may not be as bad in our mind as the worst that someone else has done, all of us have done things which we regret and are ashamed of, have we not? And at the end of that discomforting process, the man at the table takes a drop of his blood and applies it to the stack of papers, and suddenly all the sins we have committed are gone. You see, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are remembering the sacrifice and what it made possible for us. What Jesus did by dying for us and shedding his blood as the ultimate sacrifice, he made it possible for us to be forgiven and given a brand new, fresh start. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that is what we are remembering, that that is what he did for us. That brings us to the second point in the message. The second reason the Lord's Supper has such deep meaning, the Lord's Supper pictures the new covenant. Now before we understand the significance of the covenant, we have to review what a covenant is. Let's look at the covenant God made with Abraham back in Genesis 15, 1-10. If you found Genesis 15, follow along with me as we read the first 10 verses. Sometime later the Lord spoke to Abraham, or Abram, in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant of my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Then the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I will actually possess it? The Lord told him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram presented all these to him, killed them, then he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Now, that is a strange passage, is it not? It talks about a promise from God that he will, Abraham, will one day be a great nation whose descendants will be so numerous that they will be like the stars that you see in the sky at night. And then God has him 
kill three animals and split them half and half. Now what doesn't make sense to us would have made perfect sense in the ancient world. It was the cutting of a covenant. A covenant was when two people made a solemn promise and they would split an animal half from half, put the two halves in separate places on a hillside, and then the two people making the covenant would walk between the two halves of the animal, and this is what they said by doing that. May we be split limb from limb if we do not keep the promise which we are making today. It was the most solemn promise you can make. And notice who was making the promise. God. Did you see it? Then the Lord said, told him, verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. Verse 9, the Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And so this process takes place. Here was the meaning behind the practice. It was the most solemn covenant promise imaginable. And as Jesus prepared to die for them, he told his followers that he was establishing a new covenant. Look in verse 28. Back in Matthew 26, Jesus said, For this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. God said, Jesus said, I am the one sacrificed to establish the covenant. When I hear the story of the covenant God made with Abraham, I have to admit I feel a bit sorry for those animals who were split. But then I read the story of Jesus. And I realize that God's covenant was with us was made at the expense of him giving his only son. Unimaginable. I can't imagine allowing my son to do that for someone else, one of my sons. I can't imagine. It's, it's beyond comprehension. But as difficult as that is for me, it is unimaginable that God would do that for us. Look at the next statement in your notes. Jesus' death proves the covenant God made with us. In the Old Testament, God made a covenant with His people promising if they remained faithful, He would bless them. And He said if they were unfaithful, He would not bless them. They would have problems. That was a serious promise between God and His people. But I want you to notice the covenant Jesus established here was something new. This wasn't a repeat of the Old Testament covenant. This was a new covenant, a fresh promise from God. Next statement in your notes. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we no longer go through a priest to be righteous. We now come directly to Jesus and trust Him to make us right with God. Jesus was connecting the Lord's Supper with the sacrifice He was about to make. It was the sacrifice that He wanted them to understand and remember. It's the reason the Christian faith focuses so much upon Jesus. He is not just part of the Christian faith. He is the center of the Christian faith. Without Jesus and His death, we are hopelessly doomed. And so when we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are remembering, we are celebrating, we are recalling a God that loves us that much that He would go to those lengths to make us right with Himself. And that brings us to the final reason that the Lord's Supper has so much meaning. Third point, the Lord's Supper anticipates Christ's return. The Lord's Supper, in a very real way, is the wrong way to refer to the meal, or the Last Supper. It's true enough, on one hand, it was His final meal with them, but it was not the ultimate final meal. It was the last Passover meal He, he would take with His 12 closest friends here on earth. It was their final meal with Him in that special Passover celebration, because He was about to die for them. He wouldn't be around to celebrate another Passover with His men. But it was also not the last meal. Notice Jesus said, this is the final time I'm taking the meal with you here. 
But contained in that statement is the promise that he will one day celebrate the Passover, the sacrifice, with them again in heaven. Are you ready for something that's really amazing? The next time he celebrates this meal, it won't just be the apostles sitting at the table with him. Those of us who believers, we will be there too. The Lord's Supper is meaningful, isn't it? It reminds us of all those things. But can you imagine when we get to heaven and the Lord himself serves us? Can you imagine coming up and taking a bit of bread from the hand of Jesus himself? And as he hands you the bread, you see the nail prints. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being given a cup to remember and celebrate Jesus' sacrifice? And as he hands you the cup to take, you see the wounds. Unimaginable. I cannot even begin to understand and comprehend. As meaningful as this is, it will pale in comparison to our understanding of what Jesus has done for us when he is the one serving the meal. Truly, truly remarkable. You see, the Last Supper is not the Final Supper. When we celebrate the ultimate Lord's Supper, we will be celebrating it with the Lord Himself. Look at the next statement in your notes. We look forward to the day when we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper with the Lord. In a very real way, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're not only looking back at what He did when He died on the cross, we're also looking ahead to the promise that hasn't yet been fulfilled when we will join the Savior in heaven and live with Him for an eternity and when we will gather and celebrate this celebration of His sacrifice for us. Now I want to ask a question. And at first glance, it's going to seem to have absolutely nothing to do with anything I've talked about this morning. But hang with me, I will tie it in. Does anyone know who was proclaimed the athlete of the century from 1900 to 2000? Anybody know who is considered the athlete of the century by many? Jesse Owens would be a good choice, but that's not who... Forget which organization did this study, and they, they, they claim that the athlete of the century was Michael Jordan. During his final season, anybody want to guess how much he made per game? I mean, it's, you guys probably make it in a week, just not in a single game. $300,000 a game. That equals $10,000 a minute. And that wasn't his biggest income. He also endorsed products. And for his endorsement of the, of the various products that he represented, he made an additional $40 million a year. In other words, he averaged $178,100 per day from endorsements every single day of the year. See, which was more than the games because he didn't play 365 days of the year. He made $52,000 during seven hours of sleep. When he went to see a movie, it cost him about $10 and he made $18,500 while he was watching it. If he decided to boil a five-minute egg, he made $618 while boiling the egg. He made $7,415 per hour more than the minimum wage. If he wanted to save up for a new Acura NSX at the height of his earning power at the end of his time, it had a price tag of $90,000 and it didn't take him 12 years, it took him 12 hours. If somebody were to hand him his salary and endorsement money, they would have to do it at the rate of $2 per second. Assuming he put the federal maximum of $15 of his income into a 401k account, he would hit the federal cap of $9,500 at 8.30 a.m. on January the 1st. If, he, if you were given a penny for every $10 he made, you'd make $65,000 a year. He made $19.60 while watching the 100-meter dash at the Olympics. And while a common person spending about $20 for a meal at his trendy Chicago restaurant, 
he'll make $5,600. His last year in the NBA, he made more than twice as much as all the U.S. presidents combined. That's amazing. However, if Michael Jordan were to save 100% of his income for the next 250 years, he will still have more, he will still have less than Michael Gates, or, jo or Bill Gates, Michael Gates. <laughs> Nerd Trump's athlete. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Here's precisely what. For all the millions that Michael Jordan has and the millions and billions that Bill Gates has, five minutes after they die, if they do not know the Lord, I would rather be me. I have a rich uncle who passed away about four or five years ago. I've told you about him before. He would max out what he could put in a bank. $200,000. And by the end of his life, he would put $200,000 in banks and he was traveling 100 miles to find new banks. He did not leave me anything, by the way. <laughs> Just thought I would let you know. <laughs> no, I'm fine. But at the end of my Uncle Wayne's life, I felt sorry for him because he left it all behind. He had lived his entire life for his money. and He was good at making money. He always had a Corvette. He had a DeLorean at one time. He built a 5,000 square foot house on a lake. Had two condos in Florida. He was filthy rich. But a minute after he died, he didn't have any of it. You see, the hope of the Lord's Supper is that what we have gives us not only meaning here, but for eternity. It is a treasure that cannot be valued by human values. It goes beyond any of that. And although we are, it, Michael Jordan's wealth was absolutely remarkable and phenomenal, and Bill Gates is even beyond that, at the end of life, it's not what matters. What matters is our relationship with our Savior who died for us. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, as we will do in just a few moments, we are celebrating, we are remembering, we are honoring a Savior who went to those lengths so we could have the hope that we possess. A hope that exceeds anything you could hope for if you were worth a hundred billion dollars. Because it's eternal, not temporary.